Stacy Lynn Harp is coaching with heart. Thank you for listening to this audio presentation. To learn more about Stacy and her coaching services, visit StacyLHarp.com. That's S T A C Y L Harp.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Coaching with Heart. I want to thank you so much for taking this time to spend with me. And I want to let you know, I really, really do appreciate the fact that you have done that. I know that you can listen to many people and the many shows, and the feedback I've been getting on this show has been really, really, really encouraging. And so I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for just being a part of this community and and uh, encouraging me, and I hope and pray that this encourages you. Today what I want to do is I want to um, look at one aspect of friendship that uh, I'm going to call covenant friendship. And really, this is this focuses on our relationship, our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, and so as you're listening to this, I want you to consider Jesus, look at Jesus, because Jesus is... Uh, for every believer, not only is he Lord, but he, he says that we can call him friend. And so he is our best friend. And, uh, and I want to read you Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And then I want to discuss this a little bit. It says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion... Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and one in purpose. I just want to read that part first, and then make some comments. Let's look at a couple of things in here that we have in our our covenant relationship, our covenant friendship with Christ. Number one, we get comfort from his love. Christ comforts us, and being loved by him offers us comfort. Um, We have fellowship with him, with the Spirit. We receive his tenderness and his compassion towards us, because that's what he is. He's tender and compassionate towards us. And that is an amazing thing. That is a truly, truly amazing thing, because we know that Jesus is... A comforter to his friends. Is he not? Think about it. How many times in scripture have you actually read where Jesus said to his friends mean stuff or, you know, made them feel bad? I can't think of anything. I can think of I can think of times when Jesus rebuked people who weren't his friends, but to who but to his friends he never said anything. You know, even to Peter when Peter denied him, Jesus didn't say anything mean to him. And so that's a great, great example to us, isn't it? That we can know that in our relationship with Christ, he's going to comfort us and we get comfort from his love. And what is his love? Let's, rem- let's, rem- let's remind ourselves what this is. His love is unconditional. Meaning that we cannot lose his love at any time. doesn't matter what we do, say, think, or how we act. His love is unconditional. He will never, ever, ever, ever stop loving us. Of course, our part in this relationship with Christ is hopefully that we're not going to go around trying to abuse him or or the fact that his unconditional love for us is there. We're, our goal is to be like him. To be just a, just as good a friend to Jesus as he is to us. Have you ever thought of it that way? Have you ever thought, gosh, you know, Jesus has done all this stuff for me and I just wish I could do so much for him. Not because we're ordered to, but because simply we love him and we want to give our best to him. Something to think about. Now I want to read, I want to continue to read in, in Philippians chapter 2 um, because this is this actually gives us Um, A little bit more insight. It says here, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Okay? So I just want to stop there. Do nothing out of selfishness, selfish ambition or vain conceit. You know what? 
Um, Jesus never did that. Jesus never did anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. He's such a great example. It wasn't like he was walking around going, Hey, look at me, I'm so great. Oh, look at me, you have to follow me because look at me, I'm so great. And this is God, mind you. And he could have if he wanted to, uh, but he didn't. And yet, it's it's funny because one of the um, things I read here was was um, in regards to uh, being aware of selfish ambition. Basically, somebody put it this way. They said, don't spend your efforts on advancing yourself, but rather advancing the cause to which God called you. And in modern day Christianity in America, um, it's very easy to look at certain ministries and go, huh, you know, I think they're kind of advancing their own cause there. Um, that ministry actually has that person's name as the ministry. And <laughs> whose cause are we thinking about here? You know, it, it, Jesus never did that. He never set up a ministry called Jesus Christ Ministries. He just never did, you know. In fact, his his whole purpose was to point people to the Father so that they would come to know the Father and be in a relationship with him and have their sins forgiven. Actually, that's the whole reason Jesus came down to earth, was so that he could die on a cross, the death, one of the, the probably the most horrible death a person could ever die because of my sin and your sin. And he was completely sinless. So he was the sacrifice. He was the replacement on that cross for my sin. And what makes Christianity so great, and if you happen to be an unbeliever and you don't know this, I just want to say, Christianity, what's different between Christianity and most, and pretty much every other world religion, is that Christ came to pay our price, right? He, We did bad stuff that separated us from from fellowship with God. So Jesus came to be that bridge. And the way that he could do that was by dying on a cross. And that was a brutal death. So that cross is the bridge that gets us from here to the other side. We have to walk through that cross. So Jesus um, paid our penalty. Or you can look at it this way. Let's say you have a, a fine uh, and it's a zillion dollars and you're brought before a judge. And that judge says... <clears throat> pay up. And you're like, uh, I can't. And that judge says, well, if you don't pay up, guess what? You're going to spend all light, your whole life in jail. And then out of nowhere, up comes somebody in a suit. They, they step in. They go, okay, wait, hold on. I'll do it. I'll pay the penalty. I'll go to jail so this person can be free. That's very simplified. But that's basically what Jesus did for us. If we choose to receive him and accept him, uh, as our friend. Um, and so here's the thing. Jesus didn't advance his efforts. He advanced the effort of his father, which was basically to give us eternal life. And that's pretty cool. I mean, that's really, really cool when you think about it. I mean, it's totally cool. And we could go into that and maybe in another show, but I have to, um, I have to continue here. <laughs> so anyway, as I was saying here in Philippians chapter 2, it says here, So do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others ben better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Okay, I'll just stop there for a second. So, in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Um, it is very hard to do all of this. It's very hard, because by nature, we're all selfish people. Um, and so, you know what? It's to be a servant. Uh, to be a servant and the Bible doesn't say we can't look out for our own interests. That's not what it says. It says each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Um, for example, let me give you an example. Let's say uh, somebody comes to you and they say, you know what? Uh, 
I I need a new pair of shoes, or I, I need a pair of shoes. What would you do? Let's say you had a whole bunch of shoes in your closet you never wore. In fact, let's say you had some new ones that you actually never wore and everything, and somebody came to you and said, I, I need a pair of shoes. What would you do? Would you go and try to find a cheap pair of shoes or a used pair of shoes and say, here you go, here's some used shoes? Or would you go and buy them a new pair of shoes? Let's say it's a homeless person on the street, and they're holding a sign, and they're asking for uh, for something, like a, j- a jacket or something. What would you do? Would you give them the jacket off your back, or would you go and buy them a new jacket? Or would you go to some place and find a ratty old cheap jacket that you just give to them? Right? So th- the the question is, what would you do? Would you Would you care more? about getting the best for yourself or would you rather give the best to others and you know what Jesus did the best for us he did the best he could have ever done he could have probably taken the easy way out you know but he didn't he did the best he gave his whole life for us um, and so the Bible here in in the second in in the second chapter of Philippians is basically just saying hey you know what? Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but made himself no- nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. It's very powerful, everybody. Um, it is a very powerful thing to know that the creator of you chose to come down to earth in human flesh and become a man so that he could die in your spot to pay for all the bad stuff you ever did in order for you to get into heaven and get an eternal life. That sounds like a completely insane message to people who don't get it. But here's the thing. History backs it up. Archaeology backs it up. Science backs it up. You do need faith. But all of the evidence is there. It's true. This is what he did. There is evidence this Jesus walked on earth. There's evidence his body has never been found, that he rose from the dead three days later. And that's what makes Christianity different than all these other religions. All the other religions want somebody... You know, their leader wants everybody to do stuff for them and to lift them up and make their name great. And yet Jesus, what he did was he laid down his life in my spot so that I could get eternal life. And he not only laid down his life for me, but he did it. He did it so that he could be in a an eternal relationship with me if I chose to receive that. I have to read you this uh, from the Bible. Check this out. This is in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, beginning of verse 1. It says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He became as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. By the way, that was John the Baptist. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, this is referring to Jesus now, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. This was Israel, by the way, the Jewish people. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Listen, let me say that again. This is John chapter 1, verse 12. It says, and this is referring to Jesus. Yet to all who received him, to all who received Jesus, to those who believed in his name, in the name of Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. Listen to this. Children not 
of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. So this is where the whole born again thing comes in. When you receive Jesus, you are born of God. You're born of the Spirit. And then this is what it says. The Word became flesh. This is Jesus. So Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because I want to read you one other verse uh, that's very important for you to hear. A couple other verses. And this is what it is. I'm scrolling through the page right here. Okay, so here's what it says. In John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that's Jesus, who we're talking about, the, our covenant friend, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then get this. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly, plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So there you go. That's what a relationship with Jesus is. That's how you become a, a friend of Jesus. And you, you come to have a covenant friendship with him. It is an amazing, amazing thing. And if you're somebody who's never heard this message, please leave me a comment or send me an email. All the information is right there on the page. Just know this, that... The covenant relation, uh, covenant friendship with Jesus is the best friendship you're ever going to have. And if you're a believer, I want to encourage you to press in, draw near to God. Like I said in yesterday's show in James chapter 4, verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And that friendship you have with him will just continue to bless others in your friendships with them. Thank you for listening to this audio presentation. To discover more resources from Stacey Lynn Harp, clinically trained marriage and family therapist and biblical coach, visit StacyLHarp.com. That's S-T-A-C-Y-L-Harp.com. Coaching with Heart.